Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to those of you out in YouTube land, regardless of where you're joining us from and whatever time it may, uh, day it may be. Uh, my name is Toby. I am the owner and instructor, I suppose, at a small firearms security uh, training and consulting business named Mining Ridge Armory. Um, if you're joining me tonight, you're here because we're going to be doing another one of our series of free webinars. Uh, and as you can tell, we're doing this live and in real time. So uh, if you see any kind of hiccups or anything go wrong, it's because this is the real world and this is in real time. And it, it does tend to mess up. Now, realistically, I don't expect a great deal of people to join tonight. Um, I expect that anybody who's watching this video for the most part is going to be watching it in replay. So I do appreciate very much if you're tuning in uh, because you're wanting to learn a little bit about uh, best practices with regards to password management. And more importantly, we're going to talk about like uh, using a, a password management utilities like KeyPass, KeyPassX, um, some of the paid services and web browser add-ins. And, and, and we're going to get really in depth into a bunch of the different um, password and security management or password management, um, best practices and ideologies. So again, you'll probably be watching this in replay, but for those of you who are, who do tune in live uh, as this progresses, um, it, it, I can see your count out there, but I don't know you're out there unless you comment or unless you say something. Um, so let me know if you're out there. I will do my best periodically to stop and look at over at the comments and check and see uh, and answer any questions that may come up. Uh, but if I miss you, you know, forgive me. You know, I'm trying to, to do all the, the uh, production of this and trying to share the content with you at the same time. Uh, now, if you're watching this in replay and you have any questions as relates to any of the content or anything that we talked through tonight, be sure to leave your comments or questions below and I will do my best to get back to you as quickly as possible. So again, anyone who's watching live and in real time, if you're out there, I can't, I, I, I can see you're out there, but I can't, uh, I can't necessarily um, know who you are unless you say hello. And how are you doing tonight there, Trey? Glad, glad to see you joining me. So glad you're here. So with all that said and kind of laid the groundwork for how all this is going to go, I'll go ahead and kind of start working my way into some of the content. Um, and again, if you have any questions based on what we talk about tonight, feel free to leave the questions below and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Or you can reach out to me directly at miningridgearmory.com. Okay, without further ado, so tonight we're going to be talking about password management. Now, I do have a PowerPoint slide, but I'm not going to bullet point you to death and I'm not going to PowerPoint you to death. I'm literally only doing this because I, it's to, to drive conversations and to drive to drive those bullet points I don't want to forget. So I've got probably about 12 slides. It's really don't even have 12 slides. One of them's an introduction slide. You know, one of them's a question slide, that kind of thing. And most of them are literally just like what you see here is just one word for me to help drive the conversations. I'm then going to, at, at periods and at intervals, drop out of the PowerPoint and do some actual live demonstrations of the software that we're talking about uh, and the, you know, some of the password suites of software and some of the open source software we're going to talk about, as well as jumping into maybe some using the Linux virtual machine and doing a real live demonstration um, and if my phone will cooperate and charge up I'm going to do a live demonstration on uh, this camera if the camera will cooperate and my phone will cooperate on how to use those exact same softwares on your computer as well as on your mobile devices whether it be a tablet or a phone all right so Who am I and why should you care about what I'm saying? So for those of you who've seen my webinars in the past, I apologize for having to go back through my credentials like this. But uh, for those of you who are joining me anew, um, who am I and who do you care and why do you care? Do I know what I'm talking about or am I just some crazy guy? Well, I probably am some kind of crazy guy. Um, but that said, I do kind of know what I'm talking about when it comes to information security and physical security. Am I some Viking ninja tactical Viking? No, not, not at all. Am I some super extra, you know, high level hacker? Not at all. Uh, but I have spent well over, um, at this point, well over 30, 30 years uh, dealing with computers uh, and specifically for the past um, about 10 or 12 years where I focused on uh, information technology turning screws as well as project management in the IT realm um, with a, a heavy focus for to, towards uh, information security. So I've spent well over a decade, uh, you know, 
truly focused and being formally educated in those areas, including things like forensic data recovery, um, obviously security best practices, and so on and so on. Um, I currently work as a day job for a Fortune 50 company in the information security group doing project and process management to assure that our realm is protected as much as it can be from the outside world uh, and malicious attacks. Um, from a physical security perspective and on the side and as a passion, I actually run a small business that you're tuning into tonight called Mining Ridge Armory. Um, I do uh, physical security consultative services. Um, I am certified as an instructor in uh, pretty much every discipline that NRA has as a training counselor, which means I actually train trainers, uh, as well as the non-firearms related disciplines such as refuse to be a victim. Um, and I'm also certified by other companies like Emergence Disrupt or Emergence uh, EN Program how to, to train as a certified instructor for situational awareness. Um, I assist the North Carolina Wildlife Commission as an instructor for hunter safety. You know, I'm certified by my state to be a, a concealed carry instructor and so on and so forth. Um, from a uh, physical security perspective, um, you know, we're talking about, you know, hardware and software. So software is what's inside your head. You know, that's the information security portion of it. From the hardware perspective, I do commit to trying to take at least two classes per year, formal classes per year from a uh, reputable instructor with reputable content to try to expand and keep my skills fresh and, and uh, growing. So point of all that is from an information security and a physical security and a security consultative perspective, I am no, by no means the expert in any stretch of the imagination. However, I do have a considerable amount of experience and formalized education in a lot of realms that hopefully will benefit you and hopefully we can talk through tonight. So why are we even talking about this? I mean, let, let's let's be honest. It's, it's, it's a password. And everybody knows you just write your password down and you tape it to the bottom of your keyboard, right? I mean, that's why are we even talking about this? Well, obviously, that's probably not the best practice and we're going to get into that a little bit. So. As of 2019, there were four, just in the first half of 2019, I won't read through all these bullet points. Again, I'm going to, I'm going to talk through some of these just to kind of to lay the groundwork of what we're, what we're going to talk through tonight and why it's relevant that you need to focus heavily on and understand uh, very heavily as much as you can about password best practices. Hey, Sage Computer Repair, glad to see you're here. You might actually be able to share some knowledge with us that I don't have or keep keep me honest on some of these things. So welcome. Join right in. Um, so last year, there were 4.1 billion records in just the first half of 2019 that were breached and stolen. Um, most of those breaches were financially motivated, including state sponsored and espionage based um breaches. So it's getting to where it's not just your average Joe Hacker in his grandma's basement next door. It's getting to where in this world that we live in, there are people who have a state-sponsored hourly paid job. They get up in the morning, they go to work, they sit there and try to hack you all day long. Now, let me be abundantly clear as we progress through this. You are not as important to them as the bigger corporations and the bigger companies. That's just all there is to it. But you're, you, as you get smaller and down below the state sponsored level to, to the grandma's basement hackers or to the ones who are trying to make a living at it, that's when you become very, very important to them. That's awesome. Glad I'm glad there's one going on too. And I've actually got a couple planned for the upcoming weeks. I've got a list of people I'm speaking to and trying to get lined up. So uh, you may want to like the channel and follow us. Um, hopefully I'll have some content that'll be relevant and make you happy in the coming weeks. So, more and more importantly, all of those those hacks and those breaches are starting to hit mobile devices uh, and, and malware. Over 300 billion passwords were used in those breaches last years, last last year, not years. Uh, roughly, they attack a hacker will attack every 39 seconds, 2,220 or 44 times a day. Now, from a financial perspective, let, let's just talk about you and I to where if they breached a password and we're able to, to hoodoo you out of $100 or even $1,000. Most of us, just to be frank, can't afford to lose a dime, particularly right now without everything that's going on with COVID-19 and the, the economy as it is uh, in the United States and around the world. But taking it up to the next level, uh, hackers and breaches accounted for over uh, that there's 
forecasting to reach over $133.7 billion just in the next two years. And that naturally is going to trickle down to you. So even if you never, ever, ever, ever get hacked or, or nothing ever happens to you, if you're working for a company and you're not using good data security practices or password practices, you're contributing to that company, potentially contributing to that company getting breached, them having to spend that extra billions up to billions of dollars to remediate that breach, and then having to pass that cost along to you and me, the customers of their products. So let's say, for example, if Tyson were to get breached or hacked, that bag of chicken you've got is going to go up in price. Always. That's just the way it works. Everything trickles back down. So this is a truly important subject and something everybody needs to take seriously. It's not just a simple and quick password. So let's take it up to the top of the mountain and kind of see if we can work our way down to the to the to the village and kind of work our way into the cupboard of getting very specific about some of the open source uh, password management softwares. Let's start at the top at a full high level of what are just some generic security data security best practices. So first off, let's talk about data encryption. So I did a video back a couple of weeks ago um, on open source intelligence gathering with a specific focus on um, non-permissive environments and uh, advanced work for executive protection agents, uh, law enforcement, military, that kind of thing. And I talked a lot about you know, data encryption, you know, file level encryption, entire drive level encryption, and that kind of thing. So I won't go very in depth into it. There's a ton of videos out there on YouTube. And like I said, you can go to my channel and check out the about two and a half hour long video I did a, a few weeks ago on OSINT, uh, Open Source Intelligence Gathering. But the bottom line is this, you do need to understand the concepts of encrypting your data, the data that's at rest, like on your hard drive and not moving and not going anywhere, and data that's in motion. It's like data that's going from here, uh, like your password or your um, your files that you're pushing up to you know, Apple Cloud or, or Google Drive or whatever the case may be. You need to understand the concepts of data encryption, both at rest and in motion. Now, again, I won't go in depth. The only things I will hit on is I'll hit on BitLocker, which is natively built into Windows, uh, Windows PCs. Uh, BitLocker is a whole drive encryption algorithm that encrypts all of the data on your drive, all of your data that is at rest. Uh, and that encryption key though, is housed out there in Microsoft. So theoretically, there is someone out there with a key to unlock that drive, theoretically. Um, TrueCrypt is, is an open source software that you can use to do the same thing that then only you hold the key and the lock for. You're the only one who has the information available to you. HTTPS is something that, that's a, a big deal uh, for encrypting data that's in motion. So where I'm going with that is always take the time as you're going to a website to look up in the URL bar and make sure that it's HTTPS instead of HTTP colon, you know, forward slash forward slash www. Make sure there's an S there. And it's also a great idea, like if you're using Firefox or Google Chrome, to install one of those HTTPS anywhere, uh, HTTPS up or whatever uh, extensions that push it up to a, a secured tunnel to where that data is also being encrypted as it's in motion and moving up. Now, as we talk about the password management software, we're going to talk about not only the ability that you're going to have that encrypted password usage being used directly by the software, and it's super, super simple. So I want to be very clear what we're going to be talking about tonight as far as the data, the password management software, it's really, 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 really simple to use. It sounds complicated, but it's not. But some of the highlights of it are as you're, you're moving that password through the software and out to, to whatever website or wherever you're trying to input it, you're going to have a couple of advantages like the fact that it's going to be a copy paste of a password. So you're not getting key logging ability for someone to capture via a man in the middle attack or via key log software what the password is. And then more importantly, you're getting that encrypted pass of data, pass of a hash password through a HTTPS tunnel. So you're getting a hashed password passed through a secure tunnel that then dissipates and is immediately deleted from your, your clipboard afterwards. So I won't get ahead of myself, but we're definitely going to talk through things like that. And it's something that you need to have at least a rudimentary understanding of. You don't have to go full nerd quite like I am right now, but it helps. <laughs> so Obviously, filter all of your emails. You know, if, if that that Nigerian prince sends you an email and just all he needs is a couple of dollars, you know, to get you that money so that he can come over here. 
don't don't fall for it, right? I mean, there there are a ton of videos out there, but the one thing that a lot of people don't talk about is mouse overs. So everybody can usually pick up on a, a no brainer one. They can pick up on the the obvious ones that come in that say Nigerian print, but it's the scary ones that come in where maybe your 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 an old password of yours was breached from from some secure website, uh, and and you a hacker's gotten it on like uh, infoleak.com or something like that. Uh, and they're sending you an email that's targeted specifically for you, a spear phishing email that says, hey, I've got such and such password. Um, you know, been watching you on your webcam. I know it's you. Shame on you. People will be really interested in seeing your your all this information that we're pulling from your webcam. If you don't send me some money, I may have to accidentally release that. Okay. That's a high level and an obvious spear phishing attack that, that you need to be aware of. But more importantly, taking it down one layer lower is that could come from a URL that looks like a reputable source. Like it could be, you know, miningridgearmory.com or it could be um, ou.miningridgearmory.com. And you could think you could think that it, it was coming from a reputable source or it was coming directly from me at Mining Ridge Armory. But if you'll take the second to mouse over Every hyperlink inside of an email, like run your mouse, literally run your mouse right over top of any hyperlink or any email address, you'll see it pop up and tell you where it's truly, truly coming from. And that can be very insightful. So always filter your emails. If it's coming from a source like Wells Fargo or whatever, you know, nationwide insurance, don't click on the hyperlink in the email. Go to the website, go to nationwide.com, log in there. The same message that they sent you in an email is going to be there. Um, I love the princes myself. I, I, I just sent one of them a check though, and I ain't heard back from him. I don't know what, maybe I did something wrong, I guess. I don't know. Didn't send him enough money. That's what it was. Okay. So access controls. Least access seems like to some people as an insult. All right. Believe it or not, the concept of least access is you only need the amount of access to your computer as relates to what you're going to be doing with it. So let's talk about your children and your other family members. If you have kids or family members who aren't as savvy or tech savvy as you or who, who you're trying to control the amount of content and, and things that become installed on the computer by them or that are viewed by them or interacted with by them, it's a great idea to go ahead and create them a separate user account on the computer and give them the least amount of privileges. Don't give them admin privileges to install things. That way it removes that. It, it's an extra layer. It doesn't completely remove the potential for uh, malicious uh, malware or malicious installs, key loggers, that kind of thing. You know, they can still slip in. But ultimately speaking, it does help tremendously. Uh, it removes that admin level of access to them. And a lot of people consider that least access is kind of an insult. You know, but dad, you know, I just want to install Bejeweled. I'm telling my age here, but you know, Minecraft, how about that? Uh, but the reality of it is you're protecting yourself, you're protecting them, and more importantly, you're protecting your assets or the, the physical equipment that you have. Um, data continuity. Be sure that you have redundancy, failover, backups, and data recovery plan in place for every piece of data that you consider critical to your life. So we're going to talk through the, the password management databases here in a few minutes. And that's a great example of one that I'm talking about. So I personally have my data for my password management backed up to the computer here locally. I have it shadowed over to an external hard drive that is also encrypted, local full size file level encryption or disk level encryption. And then I also have it synchronized up to OneDrive or Google Drive. I can't remember which one. It's, it's a moot point. So it is encrypted here locally. It's encrypted in the tunnel up to that cloud drive. And it is on that cloud drive. So I have a minimum at any given moment of a, a good no, a known good copy and three separate locations in case something were to go wrong. So if my hard drive failed, I've got that external hard drive. I can plug it to another computer. If both of those fail or if I'm traveling or if I'm wanting to use my cell phone to interact with that password manager, I can pull it straight down from OneDrive or Dropbox or whatever whatever your, your cloud storage of choice is. But that applies to everything, any of your financials, any of your password management software. If you have a, a piece of data that is that critical to you or that important to you, it needs to be backed up in multiple different places. And let's be honest, that's not hard to do, guys. You know, USB thumb drive on your hard drive and add on Apple Cloud. That's it. 
data integrity. So obviously be cautious of cloud computing, what I just talked about, emailing data and copying files that reveal sensitive information. So we're going to talk through, you know, a, a financial file is one thing. But when we're talking through this, this password manager, we're going to talk about, you know, how to get into it and how it is in, encrypted in and of itself and secure. But more importantly, how we can get into some multi-factor authentication if you're truly worried about it. All right. So moving on. So Windows L. Windows L, Windows L, Windows L. So the Windows symbol on the keyboard and the letter L. I know this sounds crazy to people when they're talking about the computer inside their home. But if you ever get up from your computer, even just for a few seconds to walk away, uh, particularly if you're going out to dinner with the family or that kind of thing, Windows L, Windows L, Windows L. OK, that locks the screen and locks the keyboard out to where every time you come back, you have to reenter your password to get back into into the computer. Now, I know what you're thinking. You know, that's overkill. You know, I just live here alone and you know, have a couple friends over every now and then. And, you know, that's just overkill, you know, maybe. But then maybe there could be that one friend or neighbor that you just don't know as well as you think you do. Uh, and, you know, you're over drinking one night and you're watching the game and he slips off to use the bathroom. And next thing you know, he's in there looking up some inappropriate materials on your computer and the government's knocking on your front door. Or he could be your, your garden variety basement dwelling hacker who just put a keylogger software on your computer or, you know, a back door of some kind where he can, you know, go home that night and punch a hole right into your computer and get anything he wants to. Guys, you just don't know. And, and what does it take to hit the window symbol and L? And then do your password when you come back in. Right. I mean, it's layers and layers and layers of security. What does that really hurt? It, it's a couple seconds of your life. Most things have biometrics or finger scanners these days, fingerprint scanners. You know, come on. All right. So now we're going to jump right into the actual meat of what we're here for tonight, and that's passwords. So I want to be clear that a password is a terrible idea. A passphrase is a good idea. So the difference between a password and a passphrase we'll talk about in the next slide. But I, I want to make clear that there is a difference between a password and a passphrase. And you always need to use a passphrase if possible. Now, what's the difference? So a passphrase is a sequence of words or other text used to control access to a computer system, program or data. So in other words, it's like a, a long sentence or a long phrase or a long password that means something to you to you. So you can see the example here I have in the second slot of, you know, obviously best practices to mix uppercase, lowercase numbers and symbols in a logical, human friendly fashion. So there you go. That sentence is a passphrase. It says, I love my dog Fluffy, hugs, kisses, hugs, kisses, exclamation mark. That is a pretty hard password. I mean, that one's going to be pretty easy now that everybody's looking at me and I'm probably going to have to change it so that y'all don't hack into my computer. But I love my dog Fluffy, hugs, kisses, hugs, kisses, exclamation mark, is a past phrase that is human friendly to you because you do love your dog Fluffy. But yet that, from an algorithmic standpoint, from a human standpoint, is darn near impossible to hack. But from an, a computer algorithm standpoint, it's going to take a pretty heavy brute force or pretty heavy rainbow table to, to, to bust through and to break through that one. And it's going to take a considerable amount of time. Um, if you don't want to get that long and, and you need to be cognizant when you're when you're throwing in passwords. And again, when we do the live demonstration here in a little while, it'll become more and more apparent. But if a website only allows 16 characters and they don't allow, say, exclamation marks and stuff, then that's not going to work. So you have to be cautious of that and cognizant of what the rules of engagement are when you go to create a password in any given website. So. Passphrase is the way to go, not a password. So then that means I can just come up with one passphrase and I can use it everywhere, right? I mean, as long as it's really good like that, I love my dog Fluffy, XOXO, I'm good, right? I'm gold. Not even close. I mean, you know where I'm going with this. So one single password used more than once, period, you're wrong, period. Never, ever use just one password more than once ever, period, 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 ever. And you need to cycle and, and change your passwords on a regular basis. Well, obviously, that's why we're talking about this tonight, because that is a royal pain in the keister to have to do that. So I'm going to show you a way that's actually very simple and it won't cost you a penny if you choose some of the open source options. 
that you're going to be able to manage those passwords by using a password repository software. We're going to teach you how to use that instead of using like a Microsoft Word document or an Excel spreadsheet or like I said at the beginning, a little handwritten note on the bottom of your keyboard. So what is open source? Let's talk about that for a second. So open source versus a paid option. So you, there are software repository management software out there that you can pay for. There are add-ins that, that add directly into your browser to where you're storing your passwords out on the cloud, their cloud, in a secured fashion, and you're paying them $3 a month to manage that for you. And then you just hit a button up there in the top of your web browser. It auto-populates the fields. It scrapes and auto-populates the fields for you with your username and password inside of whatever web page you're at. And if that's the way you want to go and you've got the extra cash to spend, kudos to you. My only suggestion with that is, my only word of caution is, do your research on the company that you choose to utilize. Because when you're, you're pushing your data across the Internet, like we talked about a little while ago, that data is in motion up to them. And it's in motion back down to you. It's at rest on their servers not yours. And so however they are handling and managing that software uh, or that that password repository is critical. So you, you want to do your homework on those different companies. If you're going to spend money, you're going to want to do your homework on them to make sure that they're on the up and up, to make sure that they've got the best in class, world class security protocols in place so that you can trust them with your passwords and your usernames. Because we're talking about potentially your entire financial structure of your life that could go away if this doesn't work well. I personally use open source. Now, what open source is, is, and there are multiple different versions of open source software, KeePass, KeePass XC, um, the list just goes on and on and on, KeePass X, so on and so forth. Open source, it doesn't mean free per se, uh, but very often the software is free uh, and the installed versions, the you know, portable versions, the mobile device versions, all those generally are at no cost or they'll have the little advertisements to say, hey, you want to submit a couple of dollars to us to help us out, you know, give us some PayPal or Bitcoin. Uh, but open source, more importantly, is that instead of having a proprietary piece of code, so in other words, let's say one password is a um, is a uh, and I think it is actually a paid a paid version of software that's an extension on your browser. They have a proprietary level of code that they keep locked down for safety's sake that no one can touch, no one can see, no one can understand. So you can never truly see what's written into that code. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not saying they're going to write something into the code that's going to harm you or that's going to be you know, maliciously trying to steal your data or anything like that. That's not the case. But if there's a vulnerability written into that code, you're not going to know it until it's too late. So it's in the news. It's a breach. And boom, your password's been published out to the world. You're just a statistic at that point. And somebody's gunning for your, you know, that prince is coming for your checking account. You know, in Nigeria, you don't have to mail it to him anymore. He's going to get it directly, direct deposit out of your account. Now, open source softwares, though, have a published repository of the code that they use in their software. So, for example, KeePass has been around for a couple decades now. The source code of that software is out there for anyone to pull and look at and see. So if there were any vulnerabilities, if there were any holes in it whatsoever, all of the coding community who are passionate about that software would see them, publish them, fix them, work together to help it you know, get fixed, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, and so the, the breakneck pace of, of, of averting day one you know, vulnerability breaches is it's it's farmed out to all the different users and therefore it, it, it gets taken care of a lot quicker than in most cases than a proprietary or singular managed company. So I tend to go more for the open source, not only for that reason, because I'm cheap and it usually doesn't cost anything, but also because of the add-ins. So if it's open source, the fact that the code's out there for coders to be able to see means that they can also create add-ins or like if they wanted to create an add-in to, to integrate it with, you know, Mozilla Thunderbird, then they could do that code, push it out to the community, gain mass approval, and then have that code compiled into the overall installer package for the next upgrade or the next version of the software. So open source is kind of the route I go. In particular, I actually use KeePass and KeePass database. 
We'll get to that. So format is important. Actually, we'll get to it right now. Format's important, okay? So I use KeePass, K-E-E-P-A-S-S. -E KeePass has been around forever. It's, it's one of the most heavily, it has a, a huge user community behind it, a huge uh, community of developers. Um, it's, it's a good software, it's just solid. And again, we're gonna do a demonstration of it here in a minute, actually the very next slide. So, and actually it's the last slide. So then we'll get into the live demo and then we'll get into question and answers if you've got any and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll round this up. But the format that KeePass saves in can save in either a .kdb, a .keypass database, or a .kdbx, which is the more modern format, like you have a .doc and a .docx for Microsoft Word. It's the older version versus the newer version. That kdbx format, being an open source format, for starters, is heavily encrypted uh, with, um, in my case, I think it's a SHA-256, I'll have to pull it up and look algorithm but more importantly is it's universally recognized so if i decided to use a paid service or a paid software or if i decided to migrate to another open source software besides keypass because a better one comes out it's going to work you're going to be able to pick it up and use it if i want to use it on my mobile devices pulling it down from one drive opening an old software on my cell phone using my biometric finger scanner which again hopefully we're going to do a demo of here in a minute I can do it because it ports that format is important and it ports over to to any other software that can read a KDBX file. Now, I say that only because if you choose to go with a paid option, research the formatting on it and it's a, and or its ability to export into a universally recognized format in case you ever have to archive or you, and you should be archiving in case you have to have to archive and retrieve that data somewhere down the line like for example let's say you you have a paid company that you're paying every month for the service to have a, a password management repository they get breached they go belly up your data's gone so not only did it get out on the internet but then you can't recover it but if it was in a, a format that's readable by other software you can pick it right back up so again i use keypass and that's a kdbx dot kdbx format so we're gonna do a demo we're also going to talk about during that demo installation and portable versions as well as mobile versions. Now, why is that relevant? So let's jump into that specifically and then work from there. So when you go to KeePass, and again, I'm not advertising for KeePass. I want to be abundantly clear. You know, they, they didn't send me a check or anything like that. It's just it's been around for forever. It's the one I use. OK, I mean, you can see that there's KeePass DX, KeepShare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and these are ports, by the way. These are, are, are ports of KeePass, okay? Unofficial ports. You can get the installed version. And by the way, they have versions of it for uh, Linux and Windows and, and Mac. They're not called KeePass. They're called something like KeePass X or KeePass XC or that kind of thing when you get into the other platforms, but still KeePass. You can download the installer version or you can download a portable version. Now, where that's relevant, and by the way, we'll, the version here is, is that you can pick up the old KDB versions and that kind of thing. Where the portable version is relevant is in two scenarios. Uh, number one is you can download a standalone executable file that's inside this zip file. You unzip it and you can put it on a thumb drive. So then you can encrypt your thumb drive or you can use like an encrypted thumb, like a UB key that has data storage on it. And you can put that not only the database of your passwords encrypted at rest, but you can also put a copy of the software itself on the thumb drive. So you can just run the software right there on the thumb drive from any computer anywhere that you trust. Launch your own database that's right there on the thumb drive and go on with your life. Another way that that's extremely valuable is if you work in an environment, and you should, Unless you're an IT administrator in the environment you're in, you should be working in an environment that has the ability for you to install software locked down. You should not be able to install KeePass. Now, best idea is to go through your IT department so you can get that software certified for use for your company or for your computer. But if you can't, you can download this portable version and you can use that on your computer. Just make sure that you're keeping the most recent version so that you're keeping up to date with the security patches and you're not you know, introducing a new level of vulnerability. 
that will launch directly from your My Documents folder or just wherever. And it doesn't launch and require any kind of uh, elevated access like, um, you know, admin access or UAC, user access controls. All right. So enough said about that. So let's just jump into doing a demo of it. So this is a, a virtual instance of Buscador. And everything I'm going to be showing you isn't super top secret. So don't bother writing it down. If you see a password here, it's going to be changed. Yeah, or it don't matter. Or I don't care. So I'm going to do a demo for you. Creating some burner accounts. And then we'll go from there. So this is, a, uh, this is an operating system that's specifically designed for open source intelligence gathering. Um, I used it in the demonstration that we were doing for uh, open source intelligence gathering for um, uh, executive protection agents and people operating in non-permissive environments. It comes pre-installed with KeePass XE, and it's a Linux operating system. So this is a great example of a couple things. Number one is is use of KeePass on a separate uh, computer system, as well as you know um, a different version of KeePass in general. So right out of the gates, you'll see that as you launch the software, and I'm going to be pulling up a database that I already have. As soon as I launch the software, it stops and asks me a couple of interesting things. And I got to copy and paste the password for the database from down here in a different KeyPass database, so bear with me. Um, first is it's going to ask for password, and you can see the password. You can click view and you can see it. You know, you can do whatever you want to do. But it also asks for a key file. So, for example, if I wanted to encrypt with multi-factor authentication, I want to encrypt it with a password, and I wanted to say attach a photograph to it. So let's say I wanted to go, you know, and do a picture of Beaker there, you know, or uh, you know, uh, something from the Muppets in a few years ago. And so you had to have that that file, you know, and say you'd have three or four files there. You'd have to have that file and the password to be able to open this. So that is multi-factor authentication. Now you can set up your database, and then when you save it the first time, it's going to remember that that I have to have password and the key file, and this is the one it's going to be looking for. And it's going to be looking at the metadata. So it's not just, you know, like I showed you a picture of Beaker there. It's not just that it was a picture of Beaker. It's the that specific picture of Beaker with the exact metadata that's inside that file that it's looking for when it creates that hash and when it creates that encrypted file. So in this case, though, I had this one password protected with just a password. Okay. And you can see that that this is um, this is a, a burner account I have. It's Wayne Tester that I use for demonstration purposes, and he's got a Facebook account and a Gmail account, and LinkedIn, and Outlook, and all that. So first thing we're going to walk through is how to actually use the software. Now you know what? Let's start from the bottom. Let's create one. So let's go somewhere to something I don't have an account for and create something brand new, shall we? Let's go to do I have a Yahoo. I don't have a Yahoo, do I? Let's go create a Yahoo account. Why not? Why not? All right. Now, it's probably going to ask me for multi-factor authentication, so it's probably going to kick in and not let me create this, uh, which is fine. Uh, sign up. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. All right. So, first name is Wayne. Last name is Tester. We're going to do, yep, that worked. Wayne.Tester. Let's use that one. Yahoo.com. Okay. So now, before I go any further, I'm going to do this. I'm going to pull up my, my database. I'm going to create a new entry. We're going to call it whatever. So in this case, it's going to be plain tester email. Or sorry, Yahoo mail. The username, as you can see, is going to be Wayne.tester. And this, uh, you have to create the file the very first time. Okay. Now, I would look here to see what the password criterion is for this particular company. Now, in the case of, of Yahoo, they don't have any specific criteria. So it's going to be, so I'm going to be in a pretty good spot for that one. Now, if I wanted to get very, very specific, okay, and in, in KeePass, it's roughly the same as KeePass XC, I can tell it, look, I want to go 
20 characters long. I want it to have uppercase. I want it to have lowercase. I want it to have numbers. You know what? Throw in some special characters. Okay. And you can see it's getting better and better and better as the password quality goes. Okay. Now, what happens is it's going to randomly generate a password that is darn near impossible for, definitely impossible for a human to hack, but darn near impossible once it gets up this high at 25 characters in a mix for a computer to be able to hack. It gets pretty hard. And if it does, it's going to take so long that it's irrelevant. So at this point, I'm going to copy that because I like that one. And I'm going to put it right here. And I'm going to paste it. Oops. Let's try that again. And it's wing tester. There we go. And you know, just show it just to make sure I got the right one. Okay. And we're gonna go. Uh, I don't know. Jesus. I don't know. There we go. First date. I'll make something up. You don't support that number. Well, that's interesting. All right. Well, it doesn't matter. At this point, it doesn't matter because I've done what I need to do. So then you're going to fill, populate the rest of the information. So the point is I wanted to show is how, how to generate a password using the software. Okay. Now, at that point, I would hit OK. You know, if I wanted to give it something else, like if I wanted to put the Yahoo login right here, that would be a great idea the very first time as I'm creating it. If I wanted to attach anything such as um, you know, graphics files or pictures of your driver's license or uh, anything like that, you know, in here is also where you could do it in the advanced areas and in, and in the attachment areas so that you can then right click and use that information. So we're gonna hit okay. Yes, okay, now. So and change your icons and such. You can see I've kind of email or change my email or uh, change my icons to match what they are. So Outlook is an email. I used an Outlook email icon there. Gmail is an email. I use that there. Okay. So now how do I use it once I've got everything created? So Yahoo wasn't very cooperative for me, so I'm going to get rid of that. But let's go to LinkedIn. So next time I go to LinkedIn, here's where it magically excels. So if I have that software running in the background. And by the way, you can go into settings. Just a quick side note. I won't talk a lot uh, very heavily about settings tonight. There are videos out there. Yes, it does indeed. Um, great question, by the way, Sage. That helps you to create a passphrase. That said, though, I don't usually use that. What I use is a passphrase. Um, I use a passphrase, a very heavy uppercase, lowercase passphrase to password protect the file itself. And then within there, I'll use just rando generated passwords, because as I'm going to show you as we go through demonstrating right now on LinkedIn, how you actually use the software on a day to day basis, having a password is, is irrelevant except for the database itself. So you want to create this heavy, heavy, heavy. And I'm glad you asked this question because it drives where the passphrase comes in. It, you create this heavy, hard to decipher passphrase that you can remember easily, even if you had a you know, traumatic brain injury to open the database itself. Then the database, let it do its magic. Let it just generate some random, crazy, off the wall, uh, you know, heavy criterion password that you don't have to have as a phrase. You don't have to remember. You don't have to know it. You don't even care. It's irrelevant. And here's why it's irrelevant. So as we go to log in, you will see that what I will do is I hit sign in. I will copy my username. Now, if you watch, there'll be a little timer on KeePass. Now, you don't see it on this one, but there's a little timer, a little green bar at the bottom of KeePass where it's timing. And it's again, it's available in the settings for you to be able to change the amount of time before it securely overwrites and erases your clipboard where I just copied and pasted that username. Now, in KeePass XC, as you can see, you don't have the little timer. Um, let's see if it's already timed out. Yep. See, I'm hitting control V and it's already timed out. I talked so long that it's already securely deleted from the pasteboard. So we're going to do it again. I don't even have to remember my username. Okay. And then I'm going to copy and paste my password. Boom. That's it. And that is it.
So the reality of it is you don't actually want to use a passphrase. You want to use the absolute most secure, jumbled up, crazy, disgusting password you can possibly use that it has auto generated because you're never going to have to touch it. You're only going to have to. The only time you're ever going to touch it is on those occasions when you go to change it at interval. You'll go in there and you'll regenerate another crazy password. But every time after that, you just copy password, copy password, copy password, copy password. OK, now. Again, I don't want to go into a great amount of detail on this, but in KeyPass, there's a field right here that's called um, copy. Uh, it's not copy attribute. It's copy. Uh, hang on. We'll see what it is right here. It says attachments. If you have attached a file, like, for example, I'm looking at a file right now where I have a copy a photographic copy or a scanned in copy of my driver's license attached to a file. I have my driver's license number set. Obviously, I'm not going to show it on the Internet. Um, I have my driver's license set as the password so I can right click and copy paste my, my driver's license when I need it. And it is secured. But I also have a photo of it in case I ever need that for legal purposes, like at banks or that kind of thing, to where I can write, I can hit attachments, copy the image directly, and then paste it. Again, secure. Here it's called copy attribute to clipboard. Okay. Um, and that is exactly right. So layered, layered approach to anything, whether it's physical security, site security, information security, anything like that is is mission mission critical so good call out there sage and yeah i like it too i'm pretty pretty big fan of it so again you can clone delete entries add new entries you can do general stuff um, what i was mentioning about the tools is you can go into the settings and you can change the amount of time you can change the amount of time it takes before it securely deletes your clipboard uh, in the case of keep ass you can change how many times how many times it wipes back over the data that's in your clipboard that kind of thing uh, one thing i do have set up on my key pass that you may or may not want to set up is when i hit the minus button and i don't know where it's at in this software i'd have to dig down and find it um uh, I'm not going to do it on camera. You can look it up. And again, this is KeePass XE in, in, anyways instead of KeePass. But when I hit the minimize button, it shrinks it down to the to the bar, the task bar. And it requires me to re-enter my passphrase every time I launch it back up. So I keep it pulled up at all times. Once I've woke my computer up the first time, I'll launch KeePass and have it run in the background. And if I'm going to be working for a couple hours, I won't shrink it and put it down to the bottom. Or if I know I'm going to be bouncing a bunch of websites, I'll keep it there. But when I walk away, either when I walk away and I hit Windows L, like we talked about earlier in the presentation, or if I minimize it using the minus button down to the, the menu bar or the task bar, I have it set to lock back out again to where I have to re-enter that password again for safety and security's sake. Because obviously a software that's amazing isn't going to do you any good if you leave it running all the time and somebody gains physical access to your computer. They can just jot everything down, export it, email it, do whatever they want to do. After that, it's just you're, you're kind of SOL. So that's kind of some of the basic uses of, of the KeePass and the KeePass database. That's kind of a, a very, very, very high level overview of, of how to use passwords, password repository softwares, password managers, and password, um, good passwords versus and passphrases. So I'm going to pause that. I'm going to jump back to the PowerPoint for just a second. And I'm going to start kind of sweeping the floors and closing up the doors. Now, for those of you who've joined me and kind of followed along for the 48 minutes that I've been blathering on, hopefully this information has been helpful to you. Uh, if there's anything that, that we can do at Mining Ridge Armory from an information security, from a security consultation, or from a physical security or firearms training, anything like that uh, uh, perspective, please reach out to me directly. You've got my contact information right here. Uh, you can always reach out and contact me through the, the Mining Ridge Armory page or send me an email, heck, give me a call. Um, but most importantly, if, if you have a need, whether it be for training, whether it be for your civic or religious organization, for your business, whatever, anything, if this information was helpful to you, for starters, pass it on. Send it over to somebody that you feel could benefit from the information because I'm sharing it for free. You know, I'm trying to help everybody out as much as I can. But secondarily, if you have somebody who you feel could benefit from actual hands-on consultative or physical services, 
have them contact me. So the only thing I ask in return is if you're watching this video, please like, subscribe, you know, ring the bell, all that good stuff. Check out miningridgearmory.com. It has links to the LinkedIn pages, our Facebook page. You know, like us, follow us there as well. Um, just kind of give us a little social media love so that we can try to grow this channel. And so we can try to grow uh, and continue to bring you content that's hopefully value to somebody. So I appreciate everybody stopping in to see uh, what we had to talk about today. And I appreciate you spending just, you know, about 50 minutes or just shy of an hour with me tonight. Uh, until we see you out on the range or until we see you somewhere out here in public, once all this craziness breaks, you keep living your dream.